Hi, in this video we step beyond affine transformations because affine transformations do not include an important phenomenon called the perspective. Perspective can be enjoyed in every moment of our lives. So when we look at the railway track, we will realize that at the horizon the tracks meet, although we know it for sure that the tracks are parallel. Perspective is a transformation that converts parallel lines into intersecting ones. We will learn that Euclidean geometry is not really appropriate to discuss perspective formally. Therefore, we throw Euclidean geometry into the garbage can and choose another geometry called the projective geometry. So far, we discussed affine transformations that map lines to lines and the parallel lines will also be parallel after the transformation. So an affine transformation is not able to convert the square into a general quad because such transformation would map these two parallel lines to intersecting ones, which is against the definition of affine transformations. However, this phenomenon is important because this is exactly what we can observe when we look at the 3D scene and examine parallel lines around us we will realize that even parallel lines meet at the horizon. In computer graphics, we want to simulate this perspective phenomenon as well. So we are looking for a formula which maps lines to lines, but it can generate two intersecting lines out of two parallel lines. If we start searching for such a formula, we will soon realize that there is a problem. A problem with the geometry itself, because in Euclidean geometry, parallel lines do not intersect, so if we need a transformation that maps these two lines to these two intersecting lines, the intersection point should be generated out of nothing. A mathematical function is not able to create something out of nothing. So this situation cannot be handled precisely in the context of Euclidean geometry. We often say that Euclidean geometry has a singularity for parallel lines because parallel lines do not intersect each other. To formally attack this problem, we have to switch geometries and deal with the geometry when there are no parallel lines at all. Even this point will be created from something, from another point. This geometry is going to be the projective geometry. Recall that geometries are defined by axioms. Here I listed the three important axioms of Euclidean geometry. Two points define a line, a line has at least two points, and the so-called parallel axiom, if we have a line and the point that is not on this line, then there is exactly one other line that doesn't cross the original line but goes through the given point. This parallel axiom introduces parallelism and parallel lines. We often say that parallel lines meet at infinity, but that's incorrect in Euclidean geometry because this axiom states it clearly that parallel lines don't intersect. In other words, it means that infinity is not included in the Euclidean plane or space. In projective geometry, they do. To handle the singularity of parallel lines, this parallel axiom is modified. We state that two distinct lines always intersect each other in a single point. With this modification, parallel lines disappear and we arrive in the projective geometry. So let's see how such a geometry can be constructed. In the normal Euclidean plane we have points and lines and lines meet in points. For example, this line and that line meet in this blue point. This line and this line, as they are parallel to each other, do not meet. In projective geometry, according to the third axiom, this cannot happen, 
even these two lines must meet, so we need a point that is shared by the two lines. So let us add points to the Euclidean plane where parallel lines meet. These two parallel lines should get the same point in order to allow them to share this point or in other words meet in this particular point. As parallel lines meet at infinity, these extra points, also called ideal points, are in fact at infinity. So we add a new point to every line in order to allow even parallel lines to meet. Note that we cannot solve the problem with a single ideal point for all possible lines because we have to assign a different ideal point to these two parallel lines and to these two parallel lines. Assume for a moment that these parallel lines and these parallel lines share the same ideal point. As they are not parallel, they already meet in a point on the Euclidean geometry. If the two ideal points would be identical, the two different lines would meet at two different points. However, this is a contradiction concerning the axiom that two points unambiguously define a line. It means that two different lines cannot share two points. So the green ideal point is different from the red ideal point. It means that there is a different ideal point at every direction. However, the ideal points must be the same in this direction and into the opposite direction because two parallel lines, as any other lines, meet exactly in one point according to the axiom, cannot meet in two different points. So in order to establish the projective plane, we have to introduce ideal points, one for every direction, but to define the same ideal point in two opposite directions. Projective plane and projective geometry can also be discussed in our ambient geometry model. Recall that the two-dimensional Euclidean plane can be embedded in our ambient model, which is three-dimensional. In addition to the normal x-y axis, we have an extra w coordinate, and we said that the Euclidean plane is embedded in this three-dimensional space by requiring that the w coordinate of the Euclidean points must be equal to 1. The projective plane is also included in the same ambient model, but the reduction of the dimension from 3 to 2 is handled differently. In the projective geometry, we say that all points that are on a line crossing the ambient origin are equivalent and are describing the very same point of the projective plane. The same point, for example, the point that would be represented by Cartesian coordinates x and y and w equals 1, could be represented with an arbitrary triplet, uppercase x, y, and w, which is on the same line as our Euclidean point and the origin of the coordinate system. So, formally, if we want to convert an Euclidean point to projective geometry, we take the Cartesian coordinates of the point at the ambient coordinate, because in the Euclidean geometry, points have W coordinates that are equal to 1. And then, this triplet can be multiplied by an arbitrary scalar value, because we can move farther or closer to the ambient origin on the line defined by the point and the ambient origin. The three numbers in this triplet are called homogeneous coordinates. The name comes from the fact that we have the right to multiply all three numbers by the same non-zero value, we are still referring to the very same point. Considering this construction, it is also obvious how we can convert a point from projective plane to Euclidean plane. Points of the Euclidean plane are identified by Cartesian coordinates x and y, 
and we know that if the third coordinate is 1, then the first two positions have uh, the Cartesian coordinates, so we multiply all three numbers in a way that the result in the third coordinate will be equal to 1. Well, obviously we have to divide all three coordinates by w. In the result, the first two positions will have the Cartesian coordinates. This operation is called homogeneous division when the first two coordinates are divided by the w coordinate. And homogeneous coordinates are converted back to Cartesian coordinates. This operation works if w is non-zero. This homogeneous division has a nice geometric meaning. It is just the projection of the three-dimensional point onto the plane of equation w equals to 1. So with this definition, we could find the correspondence between Euclidean geometry and projective geometry. For every point in the Euclidean geometry, we can find a point in the projective geometry, and if the point has non-zero w coordinate, the projective geometry point can be converted back to Euclidean geometry. Homogeneous coordinates are at least as good as Cartesian coordinates because they can represent points of the Euclidean plane. The fact is that homogeneous coordinates are better because in homogeneous coordinates, the w coordinate can even be zero. In this case, the projective point cannot be converted to Euclidean geometry because it is strictly forbidden to divide by zero. The meaning is the following. The projective point in the embedded model is a line defined by the point x, y, 0 and the origin of this coordinate system. This line will be parallel with the w equals 1 plane, so they will intersect each other at infinity, that is, in an ideal point. With this representation where w is equal to 0, we can specify even points at infinity with finite numbers. Let us play with the concept of homogeneous coordinates to understand how they can be interpreted. Let's start with a point in the Euclidean plane defined with Cartesian coordinates x and y. The point is here. Cartesian coordinates can be converted to homogeneous coordinates by extending the two coordinates by an extra coordinate w, and this w must be equal to 1. So the same point can be represented in homogeneous coordinates. Let us find another point, which is in the same direction as the previous point, but two times as far from the origin of our Cartesian coordinate system. In Cartesian coordinates, this new point will have 2x and 2y. When Cartesian coordinates are converted to homogeneous coordinates, we add a constant 1 w value. No, let us recall that homogeneous coordinates are called homogeneous because we have the right to multiply all three numbers here by the same scalar. So let this scalar be a half. So as a result, the very same point can also be expressed as uh, x, y, one half in homogeneous coordinates. Let's continue this and find a point which is in the same direction from the origin as our original point defined with the Cartesian coordinates x and y, but three times as far from the origin. Obviously, in homogeneous coordinates, it will be defined with x, y, one third. Doing it infinitely, we can say that a point which is in the same direction as our very first point, but infinitely far, can be represented by homogeneous coordinates x, y, and 0. This point is called ideal point because this point is infinitely far. We can do the same experiment on the other half of this line. So first, let's consider the point which is at the same distance, but in an opposite direction. So in Cartesian coordinates, it will be defined by minus x minus y, which can be converted to homogeneous coordinates, adding this w equals one value, and 
we can multiply all three homogeneous coordinates by the same scalar. Let this scalar be minus 1. The same point is expressed as x, y minus 1. Then let's consider a point which is two times as far and in the opposite direction. It can be expressed in homogeneous coordinates x, y minus half. And repeating it again, we can say that the point which is in the opposite direction and uh, infinitely far is identified by homogeneous coordinates x, y, zero. Note that we obtain the very same homogeneous triplet which could be reached here. So again, we can see this interesting relationship that if we go along a line to infinity, then we arrive at an ideal point, and the same ideal point can be reached if we travel into the opposite direction. The topology of this geometry is different from the topology of the Euclidean geometry. Here, Lines are like circles because ideal points glue the two endpoints of a line. Having introduced homogeneous coordinates for points, the next task is the definition of lines in projective geometry. Recall again what we did for points. We started with Cartesian coordinates extended with a constant one value in the W coordinate and said that the same point can be represented by any other point that is on the same line defined by the center of the coordinate system and or point identified by Cartesian coordinates and one W value. In this figure, this yellow point can be a substitute for x1, y1, and 1. And it also works in the other direction. When we have a homogeneous triplet and we are interested in the Cartesian coordinates, we just find the intersection point of the line defined by this yellow point and the center of the coordinate system. And the w equals 1 plane. This intersection can also be imagined as the projection of this three-dimensional point onto the W equals 1 plane. The same argument works for lines as well. In uh, Euclidean geometry, two points define a line, this green dotted line. In projective geometry or in homogeneous coordinates, these red points can be substituted by the yellow points that are on the same lines as the original red points, but they can be anywhere in the three-dimensional ambient space. In the three-dimensional space, two points still define a line. So let us find a green line crossing these two points. So from two points in the Euclidean geometry, we created a line in the ambient space, which represents homogeneous coordinates of the projective geometry. And it is just fine in the reverse direction, because if we are interested in where a particular point of this line is in Euclidean geometry, this line should be projected onto the w equals 1 plane using the center of the coordinate system as the origin. And no matter how we select the two yellow points on these two red lines, the projection will always be the same. So a two-dimensional line can be defined first as a three-dimensional line in the ambient space, and then if we are interested in the Euclidean version, by executing the projection. A line is the combination of two points, and the two points are defined by homogeneous coordinates, which can also be interpreted as Cartesian coordinates in our three-dimensional ambient or embedding world. From algebraic point of view, the parametric equation of a line in projective space is very similar to the parametric equation of the line in Euclidean space, just we use one more coordinate. The line of a plane has not only parametric but also implicit equation. 
So let us construct the implicit equation of a line in the projective plane. We start with the implicit equation of an Euclidean line and replace Cartesian coordinates with homogeneous ones. A line in Euclidean plane is defined by this implicit equation where nx and ny are the two components of the normal vector of the line and c determines how far this line is from the origin of the Cartesian coordinate system. In projective geometry, we cannot use Cartesian coordinates anymore because they are not appropriate to represent points at infinity, so these Cartesian coordinates should be replaced by homogeneous ones. The correspondence is provided by the homogeneous division, so Cartesian coordinate x is homogeneous coordinate x divided by w, and Cartesian coordinate y is homogeneous coordinate y divided by w. Of course, we have to state that w cannot take the value of 0, because in that case we would divide by 0. So this is just a simple replacement, which means that we are still referring to the very same line, which is a line in the Euclidean plane. Now let us multiply both sides of this equation by w and keep the original assumption that w is non-zero. This is an equivalence modification of an equation, so if the original equation represented a line of the Euclidean plane, the new equation should also represent a line in the Euclidean plane. Nothing has changed yet. The big jump, the revolutionary change, happens No, We forget the assumption that w cannot be zero, but we do not modify the equation at all. It means that we extend our Euclidean line by a new point where w can also take the value of zero. This is exactly what we need. This is the extension of the Euclidean plane into the projective plane, or in other words, adding the points at infinity, or adding the so-called ideal points. This is a nice homogeneous linear equation for the homogeneous coordinates of those points that are on the line. This equation can also be imagined as a three-dimensional dot product when we consider the homogeneous coordinates of the points of the line and the three parameters of the line, including the two components of the normal vector and the distance from the origin. Note the nice symmetry in this equation. x, y, w are homogeneous coordinates, because we can multiply these three numbers by the same scalar, we are still referring to the very same point nx, ny, c are the three parameters of the line, and these parameters also have the homogeneous property, because if we multiply both sides of this equation by an arbitrary scalar that is not equal to zero, the root of the linear system doesn't change. So a line can be specified by parameters that differ only by a scaling factor. This symmetry has interesting consequences. A triplet in projective planar geometry can represent points and also lines, and the relationship between them is symmetric. This is also called duality. So far, we have discussed the two-dimensional projective geometry. Let us increase the dimension and consider the three-dimensional projective space. The projective space is embedded in a higher dimensional space, which is going to be a four-dimensional ambient space in this case. So now, homogeneous coordinates are introduced starting with Cartesian coordinates, which are three element vectors if we consider the three-dimensional space, and these three-dimensional coordinates are extended by a constant one value in order to step from the Euclidean geometry to the four-dimensional ambient space. 
coordinates are called homogeneous because we have the freedom to multiply all coordinates by the same value and this value is called w so a point is represented by four scalars where we have the cartesian coordinates multiplied by some value at the first three positions and the fourth position stores the value which was used to multiply the Cartesian coordinates. If we have a four element vector representing a point then the Cartesian coordinates can be obtained by executing the homogeneous division which means that the first three components are divided by the fourth component. This can only be executed if W is non-zero. Ideal points that are at infinity are represented by homogeneous coordinates where the W coordinate is zero. The parametric equation of a line is still the combination of two points, but no, the points are in the four-dimensional embedding or ambient space so we define them with four coordinates and one point is multiplied by one minus t while the other point is multiplied by t and we add the two products this is the formula of combination and if t can take arbitrary values we can express all points of this line in two-dimensional geometry, lines are defined by implicit equations. In three-dimensional geometry, the role of the line is taken by the plane. So the plane has an equation which is the direct analogy of the line's implicit equation. So in this linear equation, nx, ny, nz are the three coordinates of the normal vector of the plane d is the sine distance from the origin using the units of the normal vector and x y z w are the homogeneous coordinates of those points that are on this particular plane after getting acquainted with projective geometry let us return to our original problem we are looking for formulae that describe transformations that map lines to lines and they may or may not change the parallel relationship. This means that in some cases these transformations are expected to preserve parallel lines. In other cases we want the transformation to modify this relationship and make an intersecting pair from two parallel lines. F-fine transformations belong to the first category where lines are mapped to lines and parallel lines will also be parallel after the transformation. So F-fine transformations are included in this larger group. This larger group will be a matrix multiplication of the four element vector describing the points in the three-dimensional space. So this is going to be our ultimate formula for transformations mapping lines to lines. As I said, this group contains affine transformations as special cases. Recall that in case of affine transformations, the fourth column of the transformation matrix is 0, 0, 0, 1. And in that case, parallel lines are preserved. If the fourth column has uh, different values, then we expect to get transformations that do not preserve parallel lines. So in 2D, homogeneous coordinates have three elements. Therefore, the transformation matrix is a 3 times 3 matrix. In 3D, homogeneous coordinates have four elements. So the transformation matrix is a 4 times 4 matrix. It's a great advantage that the transformation can be expressed as a matrix multiplication because usually we have to execute not just a single transformation but a complete sequence of transformations that can contain many individual transformations. If we do these transformations one after the other, the homogeneous coordinates of the point must be multiplied by the first transformation matrix, 
then the result by the second transformation matrix and so on. So the execution of a transformation requires as many vector matrix multiplications as individual transformations we need to execute. However, we can exploit the associative property of matrix multiplication and prepare a 4 times 4 matrix only once, which is just the concatenation of the elementary transformation matrices, and the complete transformation pipeline can be executed by a single vector matrix multiplication for each point. And if we have, say, a million points and a hundred elementary transformations, the number of vector matrix multiplications has been reduced from a hundred million to only a million, which is a great achievement. From no on, the transformation is a matrix multiplication of the homogeneous coordinates. No, we are going to prove that this formula indeed meets our original requirements, namely they map lines to lines and planes to planes. And generally, if the matrix is invertible, combinations are mapped to combinations and convex combinations to convex combinations. If the matrix is not invertible, then degeneration may be possible. For example, if we think of projection onto a plane, then a line is usually projected as another line, except for the case when the line is uh, perpendicular to the plane, when the result of the projection will be just a single point. So the line is degenerated to a point. Let's prove the statement for lines. In homogeneous coordinates, the parametric equation of a line is the combination of two points expressed also in homogeneous coordinates. So we have two four-element vectors representing the two points defining the line. One vector is multiplied by t and the other is multiplied by 1 minus t, where t is the parameter of the line which identifies the points on the line. Let us simplify notations and denote this four element vector by P1, the other four element vector by P2, and the point associated with parameter T by PT. We want the transformation of this line, that is, the transformation of all points belonging to this line. All points can be described by this parametric form or by P of T. The transformation is a matrix multiplication, so let us multiply P of T by a 4 times 4 matrix. So let us multiply both sides of this equation by a 4 times 4 matrix. Matrix multiplication is a linear operation, so the right-hand side of this equation can be also expressed in this form. A row vector, when it is multiplied by a 4 times 4 matrix, results in another row vector. This is also true for P2, so this can be further simplified in the following form, where P1 star is just the transformation of one point of the line, and P2 star is the transformation of the second point of the line, and P1 star and P2 star are completely independent of parameter t we could express the equation of the transformed object. Looking at this equation, we can realize that from algebraic point of view, the transformed object has the same equation as the original object, and the original object was a line, therefore the transformed object is also a line. Having proven that lines are mapped to lines by homogeneous linear transformations, let us repeat the proof for planes. Again, we start with the equation of the plane, which is an implicit equation. We consider the points on the plane as a row vector of homogeneous coordinates and the four parameters of the plane as a column vector and these four parameters contain the normal vector of the plane in its first three positions. Point P is on the plane if this scalar product is zero, 
So this is a plane. Let's consider one point on the plane P and let's apply the transformation represented by matrix T, which generates P star out of P as P times T. It will also be a row vector. The question is the shape of transformed points P star or the equation that is satisfied by transformed points P star. Well, we don't know it yet, but what we do know is that if we take P star and go back to P by applying the inverse of the transformation, then P is on the plane, therefore it satisfies the original plane equation. So substituting this form of P into the original plane equation, we get an equation for transformed points P star. So we already established an equation. To see what shape it is, let us rearrange this equation a little bit. Again, we can exploit the associative property of matrix multiplication and rewrite this in this form. T inverse is a 4 times 4 matrix, which is multiplied by a column vector, the transpose of n. The result is n star transpose. N star transpose is independent of P. It depends just on the parameters of the original plane and the transformation matrix. So we established an equation for the transformed point where we have to consider the transformed points as four element um, vectors of homogeneous coordinates and multiply these four element row vectors by column vectors and star. And again, let us realize that from algebraic point of view, this is exactly the same equation as the original equation, which described a plane. Therefore, the transformed object is also a plane. This was a constructive proof, which also gives the resulting plane parameters. The resulting plane parameters are included in n star, and the computation of n star is this. Planes are described by column vectors, as indicated by the transpose symbol here. So the column vector of the original plane parameters must be multiplied by the inverse of the transformation matrix, which is sitting on the left-hand side of the column vector. And the result is another column vector that describes the parameters of the transformed plane. It will be a very useful equation because we will use this to transform normal vectors that are the first three components of the four element parameter vector of the plane. We concluded that affine transformations are also included in homogeneous linear transformations, just the fourth column of the 4 times 4 matrix should be set to 0, 0, 0, 1. Homogeneous linear transformations can do everything as affine transformations can do. Homogeneous linear transformations are more powerful. They can do things which are not even F1 transformations, which are not linear in Cartesian coordinates. Let's take the example of central projection. Central projection works in the following way. We have an image plane. In this case, the image plane is parallel with the XY coordinate plane, and uh, its Z coordinate is equal to D. The center of the projection is the origin of our Cartesian coordinate system, and this operation assigns a yellow point to a red point of Cartesian coordinates x, y, and z. The projection calculation works as follows. We consider the line defined by the point to be projected and the center of the projection, that is the origin of the coordinate system, and identify the intersection of this line and the image plane. And this intersection will be the result of the transformation. We can find 
two similar triangles, this large triangle and this small triangle, and the ratio of similarity is d divided by z. So from x, y, z, we can obtain the x prime, y prime, z prime Cartesian coordinates by applying the scaling by d divided by z. So x prime will be x multiplied by d per z, y prime will be y multiplied by d per z, and z prime will also be z multiplied by d divided by z, which simplifies to d. So in Cartesian coordinates, this is the formula of central projection. It is a nonlinear transformation because we have to divide with coordinate z. It cannot be an affine transformation then. However, it can be expressed as a linear transformation if we replace Cartesian coordinates with homogeneous coordinates. The first step of the conversion is extending the Cartesian coordinates with a constant one value in order to get homogeneous coordinates. We do this for the left-hand side and for the right-hand side as well. We still have to divide by z. However, now we can exploit the fact that homogeneous coordinates are called homogeneous because we have the freedom to multiply all four parameters with the same scalar value. And let this scalar be z divided by d. Multiplying the first coordinate z per d, we get x. Multiplying the second coordinate by z per d, we get y d times z per d is z, and finally 1 times z per d is z per d. But indeed, in this formula, we do not have to divide with any of the Cartesian coordinates. So this formula is linear. If it's linear, it can be expressed as a matrix multiplication, and the required matrix is here. We can check it pretty easily that if we multiply the original x, y, z, 1 homogeneous coordinate vector by this 4 times 4 matrix, we get the transform point in this form. If we want the result in Cartesian coordinates, homogeneous division should be executed, which means that we divide the first three coordinates by the fourth one. So the fourth value will be 1, and in the first three coordinates we get our original formula back. When we started discussing transformations, we posed the important requirement that the transformation should map lines to lines and line segments to line segments, because in that case we can execute the transformation for a line segment by only transforming the two endpoints and saying after transforming the endpoints that the result is another line segment connecting the two transformed endpoints. Please appreciate this, because without this property, if we had to transform an object like a line segment, we would have to transform each of its points individually, which is not feasible when a line segment has infinitely many points. Fortunately, the transformation maps line segments to line segments. So let us see how it works for the central projection. The line segment is defined by two points. We transform, that is project, only the two endpoints. And when the endpoints are available, we say without transformation that the result is just the connection of the two transformed points. And we are happy. Let's take another example using the same transformation, but the two endpoints are here. Let us transform or project this point and then that point. Again, the transformation means that we take the line defined by the point to be projected and the origin of the coordinate system and determine the intersection of this projection line and the image plane of the projection. The projection of this red point will be here. Using the same trick as before, we may say that, yes, this is just the result of the projection, but this is wrong. If we projected points one by one, the projection of this point would be here, 
the projection of this point would be here the projection of this point would be here so in fact the projection of this line segment would be the two blue half lines and not the red line segment we obtained before this is called the wraparound problem because we got the complementer of the true result wait a minute we have proven that line segments are transformed to line segments and Considering this example, we have the feeling that uh, this is not true because a line segment has been transformed to two half lines. Where is the problem? Where is the contradiction? There is no contradiction at all. We shouldn't forget that when we deal with homogeneous coordinates, we are not in Euclidean geometry anymore, but in the so-called projective geometry. In projective geometry, lines or projective lines that are topologically different from Euclidean lines. A projective line from topological point of view is like a circle because if we go to infinity along a line then we will reach the ideal point and the same ideal point can be reached if we walk into the opposite direction. So the ideal point is a kind of glue at the two endpoints of the Euclidean line. So the projective line will be like a circle. If we have a circle, two points do not unambiguously identify an arc. Because we may think of this arc or that arc. The same happens here. We have two points and we wish these two points define a line segment. However, there are two line segments here. The red one, which seems to be a line segment even for a tourist coming from Euclidean geometry. And this blue one, which is also a line segment in projective geometry, but uh, would look like as two half lines for a tourist coming from Euclidean geometry. We have to be careful when projecting lines because uh, there are two results and we should be able to decide which result is valid. When the transformation is executed, this information is available in the result when it is in homogeneous coordinates. Let us examine the numeric values, considering the first example. Both endpoints of the original line segment have positive z-coordinates here. The important thing is that the signs of the z-coordinates are the same. Recall that when we execute the matrix vector multiplication, the w-coordinate of the transformed point will be z divided by d, so after matrix multiplication the two transformed points will have w-coordinates, sharing the same sign. Here, both of them will be positive. The equation of the line segment is the convex combination of its two endpoints. So we have the two endpoints, and this homogeneous coordinate vector is multiplied by t, the other is 1 minus t, and t runs in the unit interval from 0 up to 1 in order to generate all points of the line segment. Obviously, if both W1 and W2 are positive and we interpolate linearly between two positive values, it can never happen that during interpolation we get a value which is zero. When the W coordinate is zero, we would identify an ideal point, but uh, when both endpoints have positive W values, such ideal points cannot be generated in between the two endpoints. So we have the normal case. However, in the second example, this endpoint has positive z value before the transformation, and the second um, endpoint has a negative value. Executing the matrix vector multiplication, we will have two endpoints, and here the W coordinate is positive, because the original Z coordinate was positive, and here, for the second point, the W coordinate is negative, because the original Z coordinate was negative. 
we interpolate between two values and one value is positive and the other value is negative. When we interpolate between a positive and a negative value, there will be some t value in between 0 and 1 for which the interpolated w coordinate will be equal to 0. Therefore, this line will contain the ideal point. The line will look like this line, which may be interpreted as two half lines by a tourist coming from Euclidean geometry. By checking the signs of the W coordinates of the two endpoints, we can determine whether we are facing this line segment, it happens when the W coordinates have the same sign, or this line segment, which is the case when the W coordinates have opposite signs. With this, we arrived at the end of the discussion on transformations. Next time, we are going to put everything together in a two-dimensional rendering system. Thanks for your attention.